We're going to revisit natural deductive proofs, but this time in predicate logic. So we're going to talk about universal elimination, introduction, as well as existential introduction and elimination. So first of all, all of the rules from propositional logic are kept. So if you're not familiar with natural deduction in propositional logic, look earlier in the playlist and look at those videos. Okay, we're going to start with the easiest two rules and then move on to ones that are a little bit more complicated. And we'll talk about the intuition behind these as well. Okay, so imagine we have a well-formed formula that says for all x, p. So this could be for all x, fx, or something like this. So uh, what this means in our proof is that we can substitute anything in for x because we know everything in the universe has the property of f. So uh, in terms of actually seeing it in action, we could say then, okay, we have fa, or we could pick fb or so on. We can pick any constant we want. So what this looks like on the left side is p with a replacing all cases of x or whatever constant we want to use. So this is universal elimination. This is for all with an e beside it. So if you watch the truth trees, it's very similar. Existential introduction works sort of the same way. So imagine we know for a fact that we have, let's say, PC in our proof. What we can do then is because we have at least one thing with the property C, we can introduce an existential and say there exists an X such that PX. Because all this requires is that at least one thing has the property P, we already assume something has the property of P, so we can say, okay, at least one thing has it. So if we have a formula where all of the x's have been replaced with something a, we can then say there exists an x such that p. So just introducing that existential. And this is a backwards e with the i for existential introduction. So these ones are straightforward. We don't have to worry about any sort of uh, weird requirements on our constant a. But when we think about universal introduction and existential elimination, we have to think about some extra requirements. So let's take a look at each of those rules. Okay, if we want to introduce the universal, it looks very similar to existential introduction. We have some formula P where we have a bunch of A's in there and they've been replaced with whatever X is. So in other words, we don't have an, ex we don't have an X in there. We just have some constant. Then we could say, for all x, p. But there are two requirements about our constant here if we want to introduce the universal. First of all, um, we cannot still have a's in this. We have to replace all of the a's. And second, the a's that we're replacing cannot have been introduced in an, in an assumption because we're assuming something exists, so we can't claim that everything has that property. So these are the two things we have to look at and I want to show you an example of using this correctly and an example of using this incorrectly so that way we can wrap our minds around it. So imagine we start with for all x px and from this we say okay we have pa and we can do this from x uh, from universal elimination. Okay now what we can do is we can say for all y py. We can make this claim because, first of all, A does not appear in line three, and the A that we had in two that we used to get our universal introduction, so we can call this for all I, um, this A here is not in an assumption. This was a rule that we applied earlier. Um, it doesn't appear in any of the, the assumptions, so we can do it. But if we take a look on the right side and see this working incorrectly, imagine, okay, we have PA and not QA. So we take PA, it's line two, this is and elimination. Now, what we cannot do in this case is we cannot say for all X, PX. So this one is wrong. And it's wrong not because A doesn't appear in there, that's fine, but the fact is that this A, came from an assumption. So we cannot introduce the universal when we're working with a constant that, that came from an assumption. Uh, compared to 
this first one where, yeah, we still had an assumption about for all x, px, not about a specific constant. So we'll see this in action again when we do the practice proofs, but I do want to introduce one more rule to you, which has very similar const uh, constrictions. So existential elimination. And this one is one of the more comp complicated ones. So let's just walk through the intuition of this. Suppose I tell you that there exists an x such that px. Okay, so what I need to do in this case, if I know something has the property of p, I don't really know what it is. But I can say, okay, hypothetically, what if a has the property of being p? So I have this little subproof here. And I might derive something, and I might find, oh, if A has the property of being P, then something else happens. Let's say, then B has the property of being Q. So, as long as our final result here is not A, so in other words, that assumption is still not in that assumption, as long as A doesn't occur in the original thing, uh, then we can claim Okay, no matter what thing we assume has the property of being P, we can get QB out of it. So this is our hypothetical. Uh, we ask ourselves, what do we get with that hypothetical? And as long as whatever we get doesn't involve our assumption about A, we're good. So in terms of on the left side, the formal proof there exists an XP, we assume something where A replaces X, we get Q out of it, then we can claim, okay, we got Q from that. So let's see this in action, and hopefully that makes a little bit more sense when we see it working. So three, uh, we have exists a y, q, y, and for all z, if q, z, then r, a. So let's ask ourselves, let's introduce a new variable and say, what happens if we assume that some variable b has the property of being q? So this is q, b. And sure, we'll introduce a little line here to make it nice. And we'll call this an assumption. So what happens? Well, in line two, I have universal z, qz, arrow ra, so I can replace z with whatever I want with universal elimination. So I can say, okay, if qb, then we get ra. So this is from two, this is universal elimination. Now, from three and four, we have qb. If qb, we get ra, therefore we get ra. So from lines three and four, we do modus ponens, and now, QB to RA. RA, we're looking at the constant A, does not occur in our assumption about it exists a Y, Q, Y to QB. And we also don't have this constant here. So B is different than A. Therefore, we can claim in line six from uh, three to six, we did existential elimination. So no matter uh, what thing we say has the property of being Q, we're going to get RA out of it. And now, in line seven, because we have something that is RA, we can introduce the existential and say, okay, that means there exists an X such that RX. So from six, we did existential introduction. And now from our two assumptions here, we have derived there exists an X such that RX. Okay. So now that we've shown the rules, let's do two more practice proofs. Let's see these in action. So first of all, let's show that if there is some x that is px and qx, then we find that there is some y that py and there's some z that pz. So let's set up our first assumption. So let's assume there exists an x such that px and qx. So let's call this an assumption. And this is all we have to go off of. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume, okay, there's something out there that is px and qx, let's call that a. So I'm going to assume pa and qa for a subproof, and let's see what we get out of it. Okay, well, two things. Uh, in three, I know we have pa, and in four, I know we have qa. And we get this because we can do and elimination on two. Sorry, that should not be three, that should be two right there. Okay, now because we have PA, 
we can do existential introduction. And there's nothing wrong about doing existential introduction on some constant that's been in an assumption. We are not limited by existential introduction for that. So on five, we do have to pick a new variable though. So let's do exists a y py, because that's what we wanted to do. So this is on line three, and this is existential introduction. Let's just do exists a z q z at the same time, why not? So on line four, we have qa, so we can introduce a new variable and say there exists a z such that qz. So from four, that's another existential introduction. And in seven, we can take five and six and we can compound them together. So it exists a y, p, y, and exists a z, q, z. So from five and six, that's and introduction. Okay, so now we've made an assumption, p, a, and q, a. We've got a result that doesn't contain any a's. It also doesn't contain the original existent x there. So all of our requirements are satisfied. So now we can say that we get exists a y p y and exists a z q z and this was from two to seven existential elimination. So based on our one assumption about saying, okay, this thing has the property of being p and q, we get there's something with the property p and something with the property q. So that is our first proof. Now, we didn't have to do both of these inside. Uh, we could have done like one subproof where we got exists a y p y, and then we could have done another subproof where we got exists a z q z, and then we could have compounded them together outside. That would have been fine. Uh, however, I just wanted to make the proof a little bit shorter, so I did them both at the same time. Okay, one more. Let's prove that for all y, s, y, y, and there exists a z such that p, z means that there exists an x such that p, x, and s, x, x. Okay, so intuitively, basically everything is s, y, y, so everything in the universe. There's something here that is p, z. Therefore, there's going to be something that is both s, y, and p, z. That's essentially what we're saying here. And intuitively, we know this is true, so we should be able to construct an argument for this. Okay, so for one, uh, we're gonna write down our premises. So this is for all y, s, y, y. There's an assumption. Two, exists a z such that p, z. There's another assumption. So what do we do? Well, let's we'll start by assuming something for the existential first. And do a subproof, see what we get. So we know there's something that has the property of being p, so let's pick p a, why not? So we'll start a new subproof here. I don't know how long it's gonna go, but this is another assumption. Now, what do we have here? There's nothing really we can do with the p a here, so let's use our universal rule. So we have uh, s a a, because for all y, s y y, so we can use uh, on one, universal elimination to get SAA. Okay, we have PA and SAA, so I guess what we can do is we can join them together, PA and SAA. So from three and four, that's conjunction introduction. And now what? Well, we do the same thing we've done before. Uh, we know PA and SAA, so we can say that there's some X out there that is PX and SXX, because we have to replace all of the a's with x's. So from five, that's existential introduction. Now, we assumed p a, we've got something that has no a's in it at all. Therefore, with existential elimination, we can remove this final thing that we've got. So it exists in x, p x, and s x x. From six, sorry, for this is from three to six, we have done existential elimination. And we've proven, there is some x such that px and sxx. So what I found a lot when I did this years ago as a student um, was that this step, when you do existential introduction, is a step that's often forgotten because you think in your head, we're introducing an existential, there has to be some weird requirement on it. But in actuality, no. You can introduce an existential whenever you want 
you just have to make sure that one constant has replaced like so if you choose x as a variable it replaces all of the same constant and as long as you don't have any a's left in your final thing here for existential elimination you can then pull it out so these two steps are often the steps that will confuse people just because it feels wrong but if we think about our intuition oh let's assume something has the property of being p let's assume a is related to a through s then we get something that has both okay so what we found again we picked this a randomly we don't know what actually has the property p but we're saying what if it is this a then what happens Okay, so if you have any questions, you can leave them in the comments below. Hopefully me or someone else will be able to answer you. If this helps, you know, like, subscribe, do all that other crazy stuff that helps a lot. And I'll see you in the next one.